I was warning about the 2008 financial crisis before it happened, which was the case. In fact, I was warning about it very vocally leading up to that crisis. Well, I can assure everybody today that the crisis that's coming is going to be far worse than anything that was experienced in 2008. But it's going to be of a different nature and there's going to be a different outcome. Of course, the cause is the same. It's the Federal Reserve and monetary policy and to a lesser but also important extent, uh, government fiscal policy, which is helping to drive the reckless monetary policy. But I think the way it's going to play out in the financial markets is going to be a lot different. I think the important consideration this time around is going to be inflation. And I think inflation is the primary factor that everybody should take into consideration when trying to formulate an investment strategy, especially one that is going to uh, you know, do well in the coming decade. And you have to think of inflation not just as a monetary phenomena and not just as the effect that inflation is going to have on prices and not just consumer prices, but and asset prices. But you also have to think about inflation in its most basic form, which is taxation. Inflation is really a tax. I mean, that's basically what it boils down to. And you have to understand this because governments really have two ways of paying for their expenditures. The most honest way is through current taxation. Now, obviously, that could be unpopular for the people who are paying the taxes, right? Nobody likes to send money to the U.S. government. And so when politicians are constantly running for re-election, they don't want to have to tell the voters how much all these government programs cost. Another way that government could do it, which is really the first way, just delayed, is by borrowing money. And I'm talking about borrowing it legitimately from a private lender who is willing to take money and loan it to the U.S. government by buying a U.S. Treasury bond from the government. Now, when governments do this, they're just delaying the taxation into the future because whatever money the government borrows today must be repaid tomorrow. And where is the government going to get the money to repay the bondholders? Well, from the taxpayers of the future. But in the meantime, the taxpayers of today have to pay the interest on the money that's been borrowed. So in other words, when government pays for its spending programs by borrowing, the taxpayers are actually on the hook for an even greater cost because not only do they pay back the principal, but they have to pay all the interest. It's just like if you go out, if you want to buy a new, uh, let's say, television set, if you just buy it, uh, it's cheaper than using a credit card and then paying your monthly, your minimum payments every month because by the time you pay off uh, the television set, maybe you've paid two or three times the actual cost because of all the interest that you've paid over the years. Well, that's the same thing. When you pay for government programs with debt, by the time you repay the debt, the government programs were a lot more expensive than if you had just paid for them uh, with current taxation. See, now the government has to resort to a new method of finance because it is now impossible for the government to borrow money from private sources because it can't afford to pay a high enough interest rate to private lenders to make this a viable transaction. And that is because of the enormity of the debt that we currently have. Right? The U.S. government has borrowed so much money to try to delay the day of reckoning for so long and kick the can down the road as we've gone deeper and deeper into debt. Now that we have a national debt that's approaching $30 trillion, there is no way that the U.S. government can finance that. I mean, repaying the debt is completely impossible. I mean, not with money that has any real purchasing power. But at this point, the principle of the debt is just so enormous that even if the government was forced to pay a normal rate of interest, it could not actually make those payments. So what's happening now is that the government is financing its expenditures through inflation. And the way that process works is the government issues debt and then it's the Federal Reserve that buys that debt. But when the Federal Reserve buys the debt, it has to expand the money supply to do it. See, when the U.S. government borrows from a private lender, it's taking money from one person and loaning it to another. It doesn't increase the money supply. And the person who is loaning the money to the government can't also spend that money because they've loaned it to the government. And now the government gives it to somebody else to spend. 
But when the Federal Reserve monetizes that debt and prints new money, then it's all new spending in the economy because the government hasn't taken money away from anybody, but it's giving new money to other people. And another way to think about it is when the government taxes you to pay for its spending, it literally takes your money, right? Your money just comes right out of your paycheck. If it's an income tax, the government takes your money and then they give that money to somebody else. And now somebody else spends the money that you earn. You can't spend it because the government took it and gave it to somebody else. So your standard of living, your purchasing power is diminished because you have less money to spend. But when the government doesn't raise your taxes, if it just prints money and then gives it to that same individual to spend, your purchasing power, at least in dollar terms, hasn't been diminished. But now you have another guy or gal who is given all this cash that can now go out and spend it. And so what happens is that person competes with you to buy stuff and prices are bid higher. And so the result of that type of taxation is that prices go up. Everything becomes more expensive. So instead of the government taking your money, the government takes the purchasing power of your money. And that's a tax. And you know, if you look at what's happening now, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, government debt and money printing is off the charts. I mean, we've never experienced anything like this. In fact, I think about half of the money that the government is now spending is being printed by the Federal Reserve. So it's not really borrow and spend anymore, it's print and spend. And right now, nobody seems to think that this is a problem. People seem to think that we've stumbled on uh, the equivalent of a monetary fountain of youth. People like to call it modern monetary theory, which is we can have whatever we want as long as government prints the money to pay for it, that there's no limit, that government is free as long as they print money. Now, of course, why didn't we realize this in the past? I mean, why have we been paying taxes all these years if all we had to do is print money? After all, the printing press has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, and so if we could have whatever we want uh, by the magic of uh, government printing money, what's the point of all of us having to pay taxes? The reality is, is this is a fantasy that is gonna end in disaster. See, there's a big difference between earning money and just having the government print it. See, when people are productive, when they have a job and they go to work and their labor is used to increase the supply of goods or services available to the public, right? You have a job, you do work, and your work either aids in the production of a good that people want or need, or you're helping to provide a service that people need. And in exchange for that help, you earn money, and now you could use that money to help buy the goods and services that you yourself help to produce. And the more productive you are, well, the more you earn, and therefore the greater share of what society produces, you are able to enjoy yourself. But when the government just prints money and gives it to you, when you have all these unemployed people who are sitting at home just getting a check from the government, they produce nothing. They added no goods or services to the economy, yet they can consume goods and services in the same proportions as if somebody had actually done work and actually been uh, you know, a productive member of society. So what does this do? All this does is drive up prices because if your work adds to the goods and services and now you're consuming the goods and services you help create, that's fine. But if now you start consuming goods and services, yet you didn't help create any of those goods and services, you just have more money chasing a diminished supply of goods and services and prices are gonna go up. And they're gonna go up like never before. And the irony of all of this is that the Federal Reserve has been promising Americans more inflation. Well, that's one promise that they're gonna deliver on. In fact, they're gonna deliver on it beyond their wildest expectations. And contrary to what everybody is saying, inflation is not a good thing. Inflation is not desirable. Higher inflation is not making progress. What people want is a lower cost of living. When prices go down, that's progress. And that's capitalism. That's how capitalism works. When you have real capitalism, businesses become more productive. They become more efficient. They develop economies of scale. And as they do that, the cost of production comes down. And as the cost of production goes down, demand goes up. Because as prices go down, more people can afford to buy more stuff and it's falling prices that has historically driven a rising standard of living. Well, the government has interrupted that benevolent process through inflation. And a lot of the times, you know, inflation doesn't simply make prices go up. 
Inflation also prevents prices from going down. And a decline in a price would have been a windfall for the consumer. When the consumer is denied that windfall by government, it's still a tax. The government is still taking your purchasing power because the goods and services that you want to consume are more expensive as a result of the government inflation. Now, of course, a lot of the inflation that government has been creating since the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of that inflation has temporarily moved into asset prices. That's the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, the market for collectibles or other other things that are you know in short supply. And so when inflation pushes up asset prices, people don't complain because the people that own those assets, of course, feel much richer. Now, if you don't own those assets, it, obviously it's problematic if you want to buy it. For example, if housing prices keep going up and you don't own a house and you want to buy one, the fact that prices keep going up, that's not a good thing. Now, the way the government has offset that is by keeping interest rates artificially low so that people can afford to overpay for houses as the prices keep going up. But again, all of that helps distort the economy and fuel the bubble. But beneath the surface, consumer prices have been rising. The last thing the government wants is for the public to realize how much inflation there is. They certainly don't want bond investors to realize that. The key to sustaining the bubble economy, the key to sustaining massive and unsustainable government deficits in the short run is artificially low interest rates. And the Fed's only justification for keeping interest rates artificially low is the preposterous idea that there's not enough inflation. So this is all a ruse because the government is trying to justify a reckless monetary policy that is designed to protect the government, not the economy or not the people. But we're about to suffer the consequences of all this inflation in a way that's far greater than what I even imagined. And a lot of that, too, has to do with what's happened during the pandemic, which is obviously not an event that I had built into my forecast, but nonetheless is simply accelerating everything that I have been forecasting and will make it worse. Because a lot of people, their initial response to the pandemic was, oh, this is deflationary, right? This means people are not going to have demand for things because they're staying at home. Well, that's true. A lot of people stayed at home. And so they didn't buy as much you know, airline tickets or stay in hotels, but they had no problem shopping on Amazon. And so it wasn't that demand stopped during the pandemic. It just uh, transferred money that consumers weren't spending uh, traveling. They simply spent it on, on other things. Government produces nothing. Government lives off the productivity of the private sector. Well, if the private sector is thriving, then the government can take some of those resources. But when the private sector is struggling with pressures like the pandemic, government needs to be smaller. Government needs to cut back and free up those resources back to the private sector so it can use them when it needs them. Instead, we did the opposite. We compounded the problems by increasing the toll exacted by government. And so we have more debt than ever before, more money creation than ever before. And we have created an economy that is more dependent on debt and money printing than ever before. That is why inflation is about to go through the roof. And again, think about it as a tax. The government is about to take most of what you have, not through taxation. Now they're gonna increase taxes. There's no question that the Biden administration is gonna raise taxes. And if you think otherwise, you're delusional. But the main tax that is gonna hit everybody is gonna be inflation, especially if you're poor or middle class and you're working and all you have is your wages and those wages are gonna be dramatically diminished in value because of inflation. But probably more important to this audience, if you are a saver, if you are retired, or if you are nearing retirement, you are about to be decimated. Your entire life's savings is about to be taxed away by inflation. The dollar is gonna be destroyed. That's why the US dollar is already falling, despite the fact that all the experts predicted it would rise, and now it's poised for a much bigger loss, so what do you do? How do you invest in the era of inflation? Well, go back to the first decade of this century and that will give you a playbook. You can also go back to the 1970s and see what performed well uh, during that decade. But what we're about to experience is gonna be so much worse. But if you go back to that time period, and again, you don't have to go back to the 70s, just go back to 2000 and 2010 decade. And that's when the Fed was printing all the money to uh, kind of stimulate the economy after the dot-com bubble burst, 
and uh, what they did to try to you know, push up housing prices and then how they reacted uh, immediately to the bursting of the housing bubble. What did well? The dollar fell dramatically from 2000 to 2010. Dollar index was about 120 and it went down to about 70. Oil prices went from about $20 a barrel to 150. Gold went from under 300 to uh, 1900. Silver went from $4 an ounce to $50 an ounce. Emerging markets just killed it. Uh, they were up four or 500% while the US stock market went down. The first decade of this century, the S&P went down in value. Uh, and of course, the real value of US stocks was down even more if you measured them in foreign currencies or if you measured them in the price of gold. Well, the dollar is gonna be a lot weaker now uh, than it was then. I think metal prices, gold prices, other commodity prices are gonna be much stronger in this decade than they were then. And so I think the relative gains that investors will enjoy by investing in overseas markets uh, will be even greater than the big gains that they enjoyed in the first decade of this century. And if you go back to the 1970s, what were the good investments of the 1970s when we had stagflation? This time it's gonna be worse stagnation and worse inflation. What happened? The Deutsche Mark tripled, the yen tripled, the Swiss franc tripled. Gold went from $35 an ounce to 850. Oil went from $3 a barrel to $30 a barrel. I mean, it was huge increases in commodity prices as the dollar collapsed. The only reason the dollar stopped falling in 1980 was because we had Ronald Reagan coming in and we had Paul Volcker allowing short-term interest rates to rise to 20%. That's how broke we are today compared to 1980. 1980, we were still the world's biggest creditor nation. Now we're the world's biggest debtor. Back in 1980, we still had trade surpluses. Now we have massive trade deficits. So this is gonna be a massive change. I think the dollar is gonna not just decline, but collapse. I think the next crisis is not just a financial crisis, but a dollar crisis. And so the most important thing that you could do now is to completely divest of US dollar assets. You gotta get out of US bonds in particular. Bondholders are gonna be the biggest losers as the dollar collapses because all bonds are, are promises to be paid dollars in the future. And as little as dollars buy now, they're gonna buy a lot less in the future. US stocks are way overpriced uh, and their earnings are predominantly in dollars. Sure, you have multinationals that are earning foreign currencies, uh, but a lot of their earnings come from the US and those earnings are A, gonna decline and B, are gonna be worth less. But of course, taxes are going up. So whatever American companies end up earning, there'll be less of it available for their American shareholders because of high uh, corporate taxes. It's gonna be foreign markets, emerging markets in particular, that are going to benefit dramatically from the declining dollar because a lot of their debts are in dollars and basically their debts get wiped out as the dollar declines and that is rocket fuel for their economies. So these emerging markets are gonna boom. Investments that are linked to commodities are going to do extremely well. You need to own physical gold as a safe haven, as a store of value. Don't get conned into Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a bubble. Bitcoin isn't a safe haven. It's not a store of value. You can't store what you don't have. When you own gold, what you're doing is storing the future use of gold as a metal. People need gold. They'll always need gold. Jewelers need gold. Computer chip manufacturers, the aerospace industry, dentistry. Gold is the most useful, the most valuable metal on the planet, and it doesn't decay. But gold is to preserve your wealth. You're not going to get rich owning physical gold. You'll avoid going broke. But if you really want to get rich or you know get a lot richer, gold stocks, I believe, have enormous potential. I think some of these stocks can go up 10 times, 20 times, 50 times. So I think a lot of money is going to be made in gold stocks. Of course, there's a lot more risk in gold stocks. I mean, you know, no pain, no gain, right? You can't get big returns unless you're willing to take big risks. But I think the upside potential is enormous compared to the downside risk. So if you are a risk taker, I think these risks make a lot of sense.